for those looking for a liberatory martial arts learning approach and curriculum, we've created Liberation Martial Arts. It doesn't just teach you martial arts. It also teaches you how to teach yourself martial arts. The whole point of our program is to remove the need for a coach. To liberate you from the need of top-down instruction and toxic gyms. If you have a coach and also have a gym, then you can apply our learning approach to improve your own progress. Or maybe you also need a supplemental martial arts community as a counter to the commercial gym you go to. You can actually apply our learning approach to learn anything. And people are. They're applying it to all sorts of things, whether physical, mental, or even personal. It's just a radically different approach to everything. Thanks to Justin Davis, Jonathan W. Johnson, Emma Ramsey, and Raven for signing up. You can sign up for Liberation Martial Arts at the Southpaw Pod Patreon. This will also give you access to uncut versions of our shows without breaks or interruptions, plus transcripts, along with early access to our bonus shows, Fighters Brew and SDS9. My family and I have been navigating a lot of recent health and financial challenges. So if you've been putting off your support, now would be a great time to sign up. There's also ways to make one-time contributions. I'll add a link in the show notes. This is Sam. And this is Fight Study. This episode was sponsored by SH, Alejandro, RJ, Thomas, Rachel, Yuli, Sarah, Jelani, and you Guy. Sponsors not only get a mention on every episode, but also a monthly training session with me. Sign up on Patreon. UFC 298 has come and gone, and I was holding off on doing an episode to have someone to do the episode with. I couldn't get a hold of Coach Jason, so I was planning to have another Jason, data scientist Jason from MMAI, on the show. And that was locked and loaded, but then he lost his voice. So what can you do? The thing about covering UFC events is there's always another event. So you have to release an episode the week after. And if not, you move on. And I was thinking, normally, I have someone else here. And unlike other podcast hosts who take up all the airtime, I make it about the other person and their analysis of the fights. I try to give them questions that can best highlight their knowledge. But for this one, I thought it would be a good change of pace for people to hear my analysis, which I think is pretty unique in all of MMA because it will always be from the LMA or liberation martial arts perspective. I don't mean the political economy of the event because we've already covered that so much and it's always a topic we bring up. So there's nothing new to add there. So what I specifically mean is the LMA approach to watching a fight, which is all about context. So let's start with the featherweight title fight between champion Alexander Volkanovsky and Ilya Taporia, where Taporia beat Volkanovsky by second round knockout. Now, lots of people were picking Taporia to beat Volkanovsky. The odds were a pick em. I know people online probably had their own stylistic reasons for picking Volk, but I think for the odds makers, the odds were about even because Volk got knocked out in late October of last year and then immediately went into this fight back in his old weight division. People making picks mostly decide based on what they see on tape and not the externalities. Oz makers care about when the last fight was fought the weight, the outcome, and the damage, because all of that influences the upcoming fight. A prize fight isn't fought in a vacuum where you can exclude every other variable besides style. Just as nothing exists in a vacuum, nothing exists outside of context. What I teach in LMA aren't techniques, but context and how to perceive context. Once you perceive the context, you can navigate it on your own because you have to. The speed of sport 
is faster than the speed of my words. You also have to factor in that Volk lost to Islam Mahachev twice and that he also lost for the first time ever in the UFC. And it happened in the biggest event he's ever headlined in his home country. That weighs on a person. In sports, there's something called the yips. And it's basically a performance hiccup. Due to nerves or trauma or both, you choke or make an unforced error. Or in the case of combat sports, you flinch and hesitate. Yips vary in severity and it can go away, but it's a thing. There's also the fact that Volk has been going from fight camp to fight camp, fighting back to back with no breaks sometimes. You have to think about Volk being knocked out in the last fight. He also took a lot of damage in his fight against Yair Rodriguez. Volk is also 35 in one of the deepest divisions in the UFC. So youth matters more than it does at 170 and above. Accumulated damage is a factor. Age is a factor. Weight is a factor. And when you think about damage, you also have to factor in all the times he spent wrestling, playing rugby, Thai boxing, and MMA on top of that. Damage affects power. Speed and power go away, especially in MMA. Look at Andrei Arlovsky. You could even look at Robert Whitaker, who also fought. Then, you also have to think about what we don't know about Volkanovsky. Who has he fought in his division who could actually wrestle? You'd have to go all the way back to Chad Mendez, which was a challenging fight he had almost lost. He fought Mahachev twice and lost twice. So, how good is Volk if he can't take his opponent down? How good is his striking when there isn't the takedown threat? How good is his chin? He's never been a fighter with an iron chin. He just has fast recovery. That's what saved him against Mendez. Did you know Chad Mendez dropped Volk with hooks in the exact same way Taporia did also in the second round? Mendez was also someone Volk couldn't take down. But context matters. Mendez was the shop-worn fighter headed for retirement. Volk immediately recovered after he got dropped, and Mendez was slow to jump on him. Problems Taporia didn't have. Recovery doesn't improve with age. It declines. All these things matter. Now think about this fight. Was Volk flinchy? Very. Did he have the same power? No. If your shots don't have power, what fuels the feints? Taporia came in with his reputation for power. So Volk was hyper aware of that. He's not going to flinch if he doesn't already respect Taporia's power. He's also going to flinch if he doesn't trust his recovery. Taporia crouching also fed into this. When you crouch, you're more rooted to the ground. So in layman's terms, you can punch harder. Every time Taporia crouched, Volk reacted. Rather than punches landed, it was the constant crouching that put the most pressure on Volk and had him backing up. I questioned how good Volk's striking is without the takedown threat. Well, how much better is Taporia striking when he threatens the takedown? How much worse is Volk's defense? The crouch was also why Volk had a hard time seeing his low kicks. You normally stand upright to kick, like Volk was. I mentioned before the fight that Taporia was going to look to drop his weight into his hook and hurt Volk. And Volk was going to try and kick his leg every time he dropped his weight. And that's how much of the fight went. Some people think Volk ran into the cage and got knocked out. That didn't happen. 
he fell into the cage because he got dropped. Knowing he was close to the cage might have also affected Volk's footwork. I don't know. None of us can know. But if the cage wasn't initially a factor, it is once you're trying to recover with the cage against your back. What I did see is that Volk was circling the cage and switching stances. What is a stance switch? Taking a big step forward or a big step back. Taporia was getting close with his power shots, but Volk was just out of range. Volk stance switched. What did I say that was? A big step forward or backward. Which way did Volk go? Forward. Right into the range of Taporia's power punches. Going back to Yips, what causes it? Our fight or flight response. Volk stepped forward to fight and got caught. I've always thought a wrestler with a chin and power would be a bad style for Volk. So, Tapuria was always a bad style matchup, in my opinion. But you also have so many other factors involved in a fight. You don't need fighting to be 4D chess because there are so many variables going into a fight anyway. Despite all that, Volk fought well and, in my opinion, one round one. Toporia ate a few Volk power shots and walked through them. Volk got knocked back by every power shot. Toporia also stuck to Volk like Lou better than any other previous fighter. So there were going to be moments where they would trade shots. And if enough of those moments happened, Toporia would win. And that's what happened. Now let's talk about Robert Whitaker versus Paulo Costa, which Whitaker won by decision. Then he proclaimed he was back. That always feels like a jinx to me because it's a tacit admission. It means you're no longer growing from where you were, and now you're just trying not to decline. Whitaker seems to get rocked in every fight. He also doesn't have the same power anymore. He won this fight. And it was fun, but he's not showing he's better than what he was. In fact, he seemed to have won still in the shadow of his former self. He had all those injuries and health issues that almost had him retire. And was he ever the same after that? I say no. He also has gotten more limited over time. He's mostly a jab and a high kick. He does it very well enough to be Costa, but Costa has clearly been getting worse and has been just coasting for a while. Thankfully, this is middleweight, where, despite the UFC gaslighting, is one of the three worst divisions, so you can be one-dimensional and do well here. If you're wondering why Whitaker got caught with that wheel kick, first, think about how anyone gets caught with a wheel kick. It's such a big motion. Well, because it's still rarely thrown. You also think you're safely out of range when you're often not. That's what happened to Whitaker. He saw the spin and thought he was safe, but he wasn't. If Costa was better at the kick, it might have been lights out for Whitaker. Another factor in power is confidence. You're not going to throw with max power if you're worried about your chin. You always take something off so you can get out of the way. I wonder about this for both Whitaker and Bulk. Ian Gary Machado and Jeff Neal had a fight that reminded me a bit of Bulk versus Taporia. Except Neal didn't stick to Gary like glue when he circled. So he ended up clinching him so he could keep him in place. It was still a close fight, but it's a good contrast from the main event. How two different fighters handled a circling fighter. A championship quality is the ability to circle. Circling is hard not because you can't mechanically learn the footwork. For a pro fighter, that's not hard. But here's the difference between theory and practice. For you to do that in a prize fight, you have to be able to perceive both your opponent and your environment. 
if you have tunnel vision and all you can see is your opponent, you're going to have a hard time moving in relationship to your environment. Context. You have to fully perceive your context to circle and cut off your opponent. Lastly, let's talk about Narav Devalishvili versus Henry Cejudo. I was surprised when the odds makers made Devalishvili the favorite when on paper, Cejudo is better than Devalishvili in every way. Cejudo on paper is the better striker and wrestler. But then I saw how Cejudo fired Coach Eric on the countdown filming, which was months before the fight. Then he brought Coach Eric back weeks before the fight. That says a lot because it means at least two things. The camp wasn't going well and neither was the weight cut. I think it also means Cejudo had a hard time with motivation. You also have to factor in how Cejudo has had a lifetime of weight cuts, training camps, competing at the highest level, and already has a lot of accolades. Can he put his body and mind through another fight camp? He's also small for his weight division of 135, but he can't go down to 125 anymore. Cejudo looks small, but still good in round one. But by round two, he looked gassed and dejected. His left forearm also looked broken, and he's currently medically suspended because of his arm. With all that going against you, you're not going to beat Devalishvili. He's going to suck up all the space between you and make you carry his weight. Seudo also hasn't had the same power since coming back from retirement. On top of that, his arm was injured. Zahudo is also 37 in the deepest UFC division. At that age, he's going to get injured more and more before or during a fight. The way I think about LMA is that it should also be a somatic healing modality because we all age and we all come into this with trauma already, both physical and emotional. The odds makers didn't give Cejudo much of a shot, and now it's clear why. That's it for this fight study. If you like this episode and like what we do, support us on Patreon. We also have the Liberation Martial Arts program if you want to train with us from wherever you are. It's both theory and practice and removes the need of an instructor. What you're learning is how to teach yourself. It's also an approach you could take with you from the gym into your world. Sponsors get a monthly training session with me, either in person or online. Liberation Martial Arts also comes with Fighters Brew transcripts and breakdowns. Supporting me not only helps me pay my bills, but it also helps me support my family. Find all our links, including Southpaw merch, at southpawpod.com. With that said, thanks for listening. See ya.